encourage you to hold on to the words that we said during our prayer, uh, that the Lord may grant you sound mind. So this year, we are praying for your sound mind. And we are praying that God may give you hope. Hope to go from where you are to where you should be. Yes, I think we have released the teens. Thank you, you can go to your class. Let's give them a shout. And next week, so next week we are launching a new theme for 2024. Uh, remember, six plus nine is going to be a, a long-term plan. So that's how I think. We don't want to think short-term. We want to think long-term. So six plus nine is a long-term plan for the next 15 years we want to plan for our lives. That's a very good right. And we are saying in the next six years, there are six things that we want you to plan. And in the next nine years, we'll be getting into an implementation as much as while we are planning in the next six years, we're also in planning. So we're looking at six areas essential to plan for so that you decide on how your life should be 15 years from now. Can I repeat that? You decide on what you want your life to look like 15 years from now, three years from now, six years from now, nine years from now, because we shared a scripture during our prayer, uh, Job chapter number 22, verse number 27, that you establish a theme and so shall it be. The cause of establishing and planning lies with you. I know how majority of you are thinking, oh my goodness, 15 years, 10 years, I'm leaving it to the Lord. You are going to wake up in 10 years' time and the Lord would be saying to you, I had given you yes. What did you plan? Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number 1 says, It is unto men to do what? To plan. God has a plan. What is the plan of God for your life? It consists of the goodness of God. It consists of the abundance of God. But it is your responsibility to plan how you can extract that goodness and that plan. No plan, nothing. So don't get surprised when you see your life, same place, same theme, nothing changed. It will be because you had no plan for expansion, you had no plan for acquisitions, you had no plans for becoming. The role of planning and becoming and strategizing on things lies on you. While you are saying you are waiting on God, God is saying, I'm waiting on you. So in this series, Six plus nine. We have been looking at certain things, and it's unfortunate or fortunate. I don't want to think in the unfortunate. Yeah, it's just because we have been taught that way, but I don't want to think in the name of unfortunate. So it is fortunate because this is planned for. It is fortunate that today we are closing our series on six plus nine. If the Lord gives us time, maybe we'll revisit it during the year. I would say that so that we do a little bit of monitoring. But today we are looking at the third aspect. Here is how we started on the first aspect that you need to plan for in the next six years, is that you need to plan for your soul wealth. What is soul wealth? We have said soul wealth deals with your burden as a person. All of us should have a plan regarding who to become. Who do you want to be in the next six years? How do you want to look in the next six years? Majority of us are stuck in our traditional profession. I'm a teacher, I'm an accountant, that's it. I'm a mother, that's it. But we have various colors that the Lord has located with us in the name of inclination that we can manifest them. But if you don't plan to become more than who we are now, you're going to live the next 50 years or 40 years in the same identity. You need to plan the expressions of yourself. Number two, we also said we need to plan what we want to achieve. Very important. The plan of achievement lies with you. What are six things that you want to achieve in your life? If you do not have a plan regarding things that you want to achieve, God is not going to achieve them for you. And achievement does not only lie in the tangibles, it also lies in the world of the intangibles. What intangible things do you want to achieve? as a person. So as Hillview Partners, one of the things that we encourage you and we want to design a template of 6 plus 9 so that 
all of us are planning. If you remain the same after six years, I'm praying that God may lead you to a church that can help you. Because we would have failed to help you to become better. And there's no need for you to stay in a place that doesn't make you better. So we want to be committed in making our lives. And what do you want to overcome? Soul wealth is about overcoming areas of your weakness that you are aware of. How many of you know that you are not necessarily a nice person ever? <laughs> uh, I know people love you. And I know there are people who like you. And I know there are people who work with you. But you are not necessarily the most easiest, sweetest, nicest person to work with. I mean you. So in case you are thinking, I mean this person next to you. So all of us should accept there are things we need to work on. And have a plan on overcoming things that we need to work on. If your grandmother said it to you, your mother said it to you, your sibling said it to you, now your husband has been shouting on it, your wife has been shouting on it, and the pastor said it to you in a meeting. Introspect. Think about it. And plan on how to overcome it. It is easier when you make a decision to make yourself better. And we want all of us to progress. I told them in the first service, I acknowledge as a pastor here, I have some bad qualities. Very unholy. Very unrighteous. Yeah. And sometimes as you come closer, you recognize, hey, amazing. <laughs> yeah. I didn't come from heaven. So I know the areas that I need to work on in my life. And I'm asking God to grant me grace. Work on your life before somebody else you know how bad it is? You know how irritated you become when somebody says, you need to work on this. The lion in you is like, Argh. And then we talked about social wealth, that we need to have a plan regarding how we increase our network, net worth, and people in our life with goodness of heart. You need in the progress of your life to have a good network, to have people with good net worth, to have people with goodness of heart. Some of you, the reason why your life is too tight is because people around you have evil hearts. Or your life is tight because people around you are all broke. So you have to say this, all of them. It's always, can you borrow me? Can you, can you, can you? No one ever asks, how are you? How can I help you? Have, have, you, have you paid for the children, your school fees? We need people in our life. We call them destiny helpers. Who can help us go to the world of our dreams? And if you are surrounded by parasites who are just taken, you might stay in one place for the longest time. Put your hand on your chest and say, God, I pray for the gift of good people in my life. You know, it's so sweet when you meet the right people. Good people who do, are not looking for an opportunity to take for you. They want to empower you to go forward. If there is any greatest prayer, I pray is that Lord, lead me to the right people who understand me, who have a goodness of heart towards me, who wants to help me move forward. And when I see them, Lord, help me to do the same. So this morning we want to look at a very important third aspect. I've told you we'd look at six, but we have... We have six years still left with ending the six on 2030, so we still have time. So I want to look at the third one, and I'm praying that God may make me behave like a good boy I want to be. I put in my status God's favorite boy. I want to become a good boy, like a good boy. So, so I'm praying that this morning the Lord may help me to encourage you. And the aim of this discussion is to help you recognize God's plan for your life and also your role in God's plan. Can I explain that again? God has a plan. You have a role to play in the plan of God. 
Majority of us take everything and we say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, everything today in the service, I surrender it all to you. And we absolve ourselves from our responsibility and doing certain things. So I want to show you in the service, you have a role to play in the plan of God. Remember we have said this is a wisdom a series. So we are looking at financial wealth. One of the things you need to plan for when you are dealing with 6 plus 9 is to plan on how to become financially independent. And let's go beyond financial independence. It's to plan for being financially wealthy. Jesus said, John chapter number 10, verse number 10, he says, I've come so that they may have life and life in abundance. If there's anything you should never accept, is to accept mediocrity and suffering and trouble and lack as a standard of living. Reject the idea. As much as you may need to accept the idea that currently you are struggling, you need to deal with your budget, you need to deal with things, you may need to minimize that and that and minimize that and that and adjust your plan. In your mind, refuse to accept that standard of living as a standard for your life. You may not be having a house, you are renting and you are paying rent, or whatever. Things are tough. You are, you are making ends meet to make things happen. I am praying that the Lord may lead you to the place of wealth. But here's what we need you to do, is to reject the idea that this is where God intended you to be. It may be that because of absence of wisdom, because of failure to read circumstances, and because of the background that you are coming from, things are like that. I refuse to be who I used to be. And please, when you see me changing now, starting to eat avocados and, uh, and uh, starting to put on sunscreen, uh, yeah, starting to do things like nowadays, yeah, so this year I'm not drinking juices, I'm not drinking fizzes, except Coke. Uh, mm. <laughs> so, so when you see me transitioning to become better, don't remind me that I should remember I come from there. There are now avocados. I need to test them. Plan for your life to become better. When I was here and we used to pray and fast, and when we were praying and fasting, we were not breaking in the evening like we do. So when it's seven days fasting, it's seven days fasting. And we used to do dry fasting, no water. And I'm not saying do that. Please, drink water. Drink lots of it. We didn't have information. But we're seeking the, the face of God. When we finish praying, you go home. What, what do you find at home? It's palichi and cabbage or palichi. So you eat it. Yeah, no stomach cramps. Yeah, so... When you see us now breaking with pumpkin soup, <laughs> understand life consists of progression. You can't be the same person you were many years ago. Plan for increase. Plan for having more. So the financial wealth section of 6 plus 9 deals with what is your plan of having more money. Because God may have the plan to give you more, but if you don't have the plan of taking more that God is giving you, you would not go far. So I want to start this session by asking certain questions. I call them tests. And I'll just ask uh, KG to give them to us. And let's just read the test, no personal attack. But I just want to provoke your thinking. The first test is called the liquidity test. Here's how it measures. Is there money that passes through your account? When you are liquid, it means you have access to cash. It means you have money. It means you can pay. It means you have money. And one of the problems that most people would normally give as a major reason why they are not acting financially prudently over the matters of their money is that they'll be saying, I'm not any anything. There's no need to, for me to budget for what I earn. It's nothing. But here's what I'm asking you to do. Can you calculate how much money passed through your account in 2023? I'm not saying you used it, 
I'm not saying you enjoyed it. I'm saying what passed through. Calculate it. And see how much it is. And my dear advice is, if you manage how it comes in and how it goes out, maybe you may enjoy it much more better and have liquidity in the process of managing. Give me the next one. Consumption test. How much of your income goes to consumption? You can do a calculation and see how much percentage of your income do you spend on things that you would never see. We are using very good English this morning. Consumption refers to spending on things that you would never see. They go away. We can't explain how they go away, but they go away. You'd never see them. How much of your income goes to consumption? This is why in the world today, people talk about living beyond your means. It means the higher percentage of your income goes towards consumption. And they say financial matrix that is based on some modeling that if you spend more than 40% of your income on consumption, you are living beyond your means. Give me the next text. Good debt test. How much of your loan payment goes into an asset? I know here where we are living, and I'm sorry, this is what I'm saying, we are trying to make things better. So no one should feel attacked. Majority of us, we take loans and we'll be paying for different loans, but all of them going towards bad debt. Good debt means you are paying for something that you are about to own 100% as your own. Think about that, those things. The next time you are taking a loan, ask yourself, is it worth taking this loan or what's struggling a little bit so that I can eventually pay this and then take off. And what is the purpose for this loan? Is it going to make me better in the next five years, in the next uh, 10 years? Or is it just that I want to impress? I know during Christmas, people take small loans for them to go to Cape Town, for them to go to Devon. They want to... Anyway, next. House ownership test. I think I started with this one. So, uh, yeah. House ownership test. Do you have plans to own a house? Or are you planning to own a house? Or are you building a house? One of the most stable security, and, I, and I've always differentiated between owning a house as an investment, which means you want to create an asset, and owning a house because of social security. Even if the house does not have value, but you know where you and your children can go. Please plan to own a house. If you don't have money to buy the land here in Gaps, go back to where you come from. Go back to the plot that you are allocated in the village. Have something. This is what we call what? Social security. And there's a very strong benefit you get from that. It improves your self-esteem to know I have a place. And for those of you who I am, you don't have plots, this is the right time for you to start applying for land. Stop saying the lines are too long and others have never been given. Do your part. Because you need to own something. Next. Retirement test. For anyone who is beginning to see signs of the end of time. <laughs> What's the plan? I used to teach a retirement planning module and government gave me some jobs and they would give you people who are about to exit 55, 56, 57. So they take them, they bring them and they say to us, no, train them on retirement planning. And once you start teaching on retirement, they cry. Because the right time to think about retirement is two years after you have begun working. Two years, yes. There are different models. I subscribe to that model because they say, let us feed, let us feed the aspiration gap in two years. And then from there, you now decide on what you want to see in the next 40 years or in the next 35 years, depending on how old you are. Retirement planning starts and is better when you are still young. 
I know how young people are thinking today. I'm eating my money. I'm too far. I'm like this. Very soon, loan would become expensive for you. Inflation would go high. So think retirement now. For those of you who are seeing the signs of the end of time, may the Lord grant you grace. Talk about it as a family. How are we ending our journey? Next. Or there, I don't know how many we're there. But if you are done, uh, yeah, if we are done, we can go to the text. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, verse number 1. Let's read the scripture together. Ready? Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. What a powerful text. What a powerful text. You know, I like powerful texts. Like, this is one of them. They knock me down. Like, literally. What is God thinking? This is, this is almost thousands of years back. I'm trying to recall when the book of Ecclesiastes was written. And this man could see, here is going to be the greatest secret of having more money. Number one, have a product. In this case, the product is grain. Have a product that you can send across the seas. Is there anyone among us who wants to become financially wealthy? Here is the key. Have a product that you can send across the seas. Let me give you evidence of all the wealthiest people that you know today in this world. Here's one of their major characteristics. They have a product and that product is cutting through the seas. Going somewhere. They are sitting in America, sitting in the China, sitting in the India and they are sending what? A product across the sea. And they are recipients of that savings. Some of them black like me. All they do is to consume the product and make the other guy across the ocean rich. Long time ago, before we had economics as we know about it, before we had international financial structures, before we had anything, God saw it, that it is going to be the ability to create a product that you can send far away and sell it there in such a way that it gives you profit. That would make you successful. I want to encourage all of us, own a product. Do something you can own. Have your own product. And, and here's, here's the easier part of it. If you can't have it, please talk to somebody who owns something and say, can I, can I become your product line manager? Or can I sell your product on my behalf? Because we have a lot of people here in the context of the town. Who do not have products, but they have negotiated with somebody across the sea. Can I sell your product across the sea? And the other guy said, yes. And they are now better here in our land. They are not doing anything magical. All they are doing is they have connected themselves with an owner of a product. I need better friends. I'm looking at some of my friends. I need better friends. Friends who cannot even have a toothpaste, toothbrush. There's, there's a pulpit we want to buy. I want it and we're going to use this for the longest time. So it costs 16000 And I was talking to somebody during this week. I was saying, can we not create this? Like, this looks so simple. Can can you not create this no engineer who can do this for us? Like, we don't, we have to, when we buy it, we have to order it from either America or China. I don't know where it is coming from. 16,000 bucks. Can we create our own product? Look at the hair pieces. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm 
I'm sorry, I apologize. What do you own? And, and, and what can, by extension, what can you take somewhere that somebody else owns and you take it across the sea to sell it? Financial wealth is never going to come unless you have a product. Something you can own. And please, let's not give up on ourselves. If maybe you can start to create the idea, maybe your children will do, but there's still a lot in our government, and I'm not trying to be political, we are going to talk about election, is trying to try to empower you. At least have a product, take it from somewhere, supply it from local. That's the way to becoming financially wealth. Look at the second thing in, this, in, the, in the scripture, and, I'm, and, and I was saying in the first service, I'm looking for someone, I feel like uh, the young man in me is coming up. I feel like he can go for a debate. Can we contextualize the Bible in finance, in economics, and in investments? Can we argue that it is the source? And I want to argue that, yes, Look at what this guy says. Send your grain across the seas. You know what is the implication? It means you already have a market outside across the seas. So, number one is have a product. Number two is have a marketing plan of how you're going to sell the product. I can add, have a sales plan. Do you have a product? Do you have something that you are selling? That's how you are going to become financially wealthy. Something you can sell. Something you can market. And this morning, I also uh, took away my product. I wrote this book 2014. And it has been giving me money uh, over time. But I, I still have some stock. I had forgotten to market it. Yeah. And can you imagine, I've been in the church with a very good book. Very good book. And I've not been marketing it. So this morning I'm also marketing. <laughs> this book will cost you 200 pula when you leave the service. Yeah, and I had thought I would sell it at 100 pula. So I changed in the morning thinking that I'm giving you a discount because we worship together. And I recognize, look at the third thing. Look at the third thing in the, in the verse. It says, send your, send your grain across what? The seas. And in time, profits will flow. So plan to have profit. Now, you can't plan to have profit if you don't do your pricing well. So I changed my mind. Yeah. Back to 200 billion. That's, that's the problem that we have as black people and as Christians. We sell our lives so cheap. I've been selling this book there and I've always sold it in my workshops and it has always been bought. I think it's a good book. So I sell it at 200 billion. Why should I lower my price? Because we are praying together. Sell yourself at your value. Here's one of the problems that we see at Christians at the workplace. People will exploit you, pay you less. Please don't underrate your value. Go and talk to the CEO and say, I'm contributing more. I want to make profit in this work. Sometimes people would leave a Christian in the office to go and do their hustle. And a Christian will be busy managing for other people and they are gone. Because he has no plan to make profit, no product that he can sell. When other people are going out to go and sell and do some products, he's left them. I'm thinking about my sins. But I wear these sins. Because while I was still working for government, uh, so I began to get some consultants to work. So if I'm having a full day workshop outside, I pay my core teachers. You're going to be teaching my classes, so it's 50 pula per class. The 50 pula per class, you cover all my classes so that I go away. Teaching was still nice by then, because uh, if you don't have a lesson, you could go. Before they introduce these things that I make your students, but please don't copy me and don't quote me. Yeah but sometimes it's good to confess your sins. Have a plan for profit. 
Don't let people exploit you. When you sell, sell at the price. He says, take your play. I mean, take your product across the sea and make profit. So this is one of the greatest. Uh, we have six years to play. Can we each, if you can create your own product, find somebody who has a product that you can sell. Verse number two. Invest in seven. Let's read it together. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. This is in your Bible. The Bible encouraging you. Have an investment plan. Not in one commodity. Not in shares only. Think about how you diversify your investment plan so that you have something in bonds, something in unit trust, something in various investment platforms. The Bible. If you want to attain financial wealth, invest in something. And I want to simplify the language of investment this morning. Here's what I want you to do. Find something that you can, that can create future value for you. Start where you are. Forget about the stock market because here's the basic thing that you need for you to invest. Is first of all, get your house in order. Before you think about high investments, let's get ourselves our house in order. Here are some of the questions that can help you for you to invest in seven. Say seven. Say eight. God wants you to have different multiple investment strategies coming your way. And majority of us, we always want to trust one. First question that can help you to invest is, what do I have that I can commercialize? What skill do I have that I can start commercializing? Maybe you, you are a geophysicist, you say, okay, as much as while I'm still working for this company, I can go and find uh, balls for other people. Maybe... You are a strategist. You are saying, okay, while well, I'm still working for this company, I can volunteer to draft strategies for young company. Not volunteer. Can I like volunteering? So, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That I can cost for me to get money. Or maybe, can I be a business coach? What can you commercialize? What skills do you have right now that can turn money to your hands? Why is it all Yeah, I used to think about it. Can I used to commercialize me? I used to be writing as a columnist. It was paying me 800 pula a week. Uh, I had motivations that I was writing for Mascom. I was writing seven of them. They would give me at least 10,000 or so in a month. I had financial. I had Bible. Has any one of you who used to receive some scriptures from Mascom? Yeah, I was trying to help you read the Bible. <laughs> Find something that you can commercialize. Before I came in here, I wanted to publish a book every two years. I actually have manuscripts for three or so books. It's just that I've been sitting on them. I think I need to do something. But I want to publish outside this time. So that you sell across the seas. Invest in seven. Yes, I say in what? In eight. Do you have investment right now? If they are not, this is not a, an attacking message. Here's the first thing. Look at a skill you can commercialize. Number two, look at something around you that is in abundance that would be needed in the future and get a lot of it. Number three, if you are looking to invest, is what do you have now that would be in scarcity that you can acquire? Or what, do you, what is it that you, you would need in the future that you can buy now and it will have an appreciating value? It means getting the land. It means registering that company. It means finding partnership. It means writing uh, uh, proposals. It means co co corroborating. I think that's, no, not corroborating. Collaborating, that's the right word. Yeah. Having relationships that can help you and increase value. I had a friend who helped me understand 
this concept. We were doing something and he said, yeah, and he, he's a very good man. So he said to me, no, the value that you are bringing on the table based on this a, a proposal, it's already high because I was still young then and I had, you know, have you ever been in the table where you say, okay, for this thing to start, let's contribute. Then you have nothing to contribute. So this guy said, no, we are using a pro rata model would value the concept. Concept, valuation, would value the concept with your contribution. And I'm going to convince every party that is coming that your contribution is this concept. For you to think this, this is value. So have something that you can invest, whatever it is, and the Lord would lead you. The key thing in this message is think something that can benefit you there. Here's how we normally say it in financial language. You, as you work for money, plan how money would work for you when you are not working. It's investment. This text is also interpreted as an insurance approach. And I want to share that. Because when you read it in in King James Version, it says, give portions. Give portions to what? To seven and also to eight. Because you don't know when the bad day would come. In traditional Israel, this text was interpreted as, in, when you have a lot, take part of it and give it to other people to demonstrate your goodness of heart. So that the day calamity comes to your house, you have seven people showing up and say, you helped us last time, you helped us, we are here to help you, we are here to help you. Do you have seven people that if your toe would break, they would come up saying, how much are they saying we should pay? How much are they saying we should, what do you need? What? We need to invest so that that investment, it's an insurance mode is the one that helps you when you get into problems. Do you have insurance for your family? Do you have seven or eight that would come rescue you? You know, God, Lord, help me. I need just seven or eight. Because it's going to be a problem. Invest in seven. Give a portion to seven or eight. Most of you like eating alone. But when you get into calamity, you want people to come and rescue you. The way to do it, have people that you invest in. When you are doing that, you are ensuring through the goodness of your heart that tomorrow when you have calamity, people will remember you gave them portions and they will come and give you more portions. May God help us not to eat all that we earn, not to consume all that we earn, and not to have a, even a, a good heart of sometimes helping others and even investing in insurance. This is why I say, the, you know, all finance is here. Go and read the whole, the whole chapter on. Yeah, time is jealous. But anyway, there's a book here. Chapter 2 is personal financial planning. It discusses a model of how to vary from investment to consumption to personal development and to social win. And most of you, when you are seeing the signs of the end of age, much more of your money begins to go around your circle. Because, and the moment they begin to call you uncle, it means wahita, it means wanyadis. So you need to plan for it. Some of you, you need to plan for people that are going. They have 20 years maybe left, or 10 years, or 5 years. What's your plan? Because the key to financial wealth is that nothing happens to you by mistake. You anticipate it, and you plan for it. Give seven portions. No, not seven portions. Give portion to seven. Take, take. Take, take. Invest in seven platforms. I have money there, money there, money there. Put it in a in stock market. Put it in a house. Put it in multi rest. Put it in a whatever. Have something that generates value for you. My time is up.
I would revisit this. Yeah. But let me let me read this this text so that I match with first service. Verse number seven. Light is sweet. Light. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. I like the next verse. But it said, when people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. When people live to be what? To be old. Can old people say, thank you Lord for the days of my life? Yeah, I know most people say I'm young. <laughs> but let them also remember there will be many dark days. This sounds like doom, but it's not, because this is wisdom literature. It's warning us. God is going to give you the blessing of life. Can I speak to all of you? God is going to give you what? The blessing of life. Plan your life after work so that they don't become dark. Kara, if the Lord, if you retire at 60 with no plan of how to make things work and the Lord gives you 30 more. The Lord forbid. Lord, I pray, help us in this church that none of us would find ourselves in a place where we don't know our whereabouts because we failed to plan. And I want to close with Mark chapter number 8, verse number 36. It says, what shall profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It's important for us to have financial wealth. It's important for us to plan for it. But the most important aspect of your planning should be your soul. We don't want anyone going to hell. We don't want anyone facing death and not knowing what to do. We don't want anyone waking up and saying, if I could have given my life to Jesus, I could have saved my soul. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. I pray for men and women listening online and those that are here that you may grant us grace to apply wisdom in the affairs of our lives. Help us, Lord, to plan for our lives and to take accountability for the things you have given to us. And Lord, I pray for those that are here and they don't know you as a savior, that just lead them towards salvation. If you are here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your savior, just flip up your hand. I want to pray with you. You want to be saved. You say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. Just flip up your hand so that we can pray with you. Lift up your hand so that we can pray with you. Can we all stand? Lift up your hands. Invite God to your finance. Just in a minute, invite God to how you manage money. Thank you, Lord. Just pray. Pray for your finances. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Give the Lord a big clap. So I think this is a great way of starting a year. We have given you tools, areas to go and think about and plan. And if the Lord graces us well, we'll try to help you with a template. But if we don't bring it, we are not obliged. It's not an excuse. It's your life. Go and plan for your life. Okay. God has a plan. I have my plan. Next week we are launching a new thing. Bring a friend. How many of you think that what we are teaching here is important? Can I see you? So if you become stingy of this message and you keep it to yourself and more people around you don't hear it, you are creating more dependence on me. And you cannot help them with some of the things that you teach here. So what's the best solution? Bring them to church. Yeah, we are here because of God. We are here because we have been saved. And whatever we share, it's in the gospel. It's in the man. The man everyone invest in certain ways. You want to hide it. Can I challenge you today? Invite somebody to church next week. Let's share what we are receiving in this place. May God bless you and keep you. Today, it's a good day. So make sure that as you go out, buy a book. Buy a book. It will help you.